Good morning. Welcome to Quack Talk. I'm Crystal here on Think Tech, Tuesday morning at 11 o'clock. We today are going to talk about the oldest profession in the world, which hasn't changed, but has morphed into different concepts. But today, it's really interesting. It's a historical look at it. We're going to talk about prostitution during World War II, specifically in Chinatown. So you're thinking, all right, Chinatown, all, you know, all those like dirty little stalls with the Chinese women catering to all the sleazy Asian men. Well, to my surprise, there was a huge supply and demand during the war for the Navy, for all the, the guys who were there. And so really, really interesting stuff. Join us now. We're going to talk about this whole exposed Honolulu, little dirty kind of a an alley that we should talk about. So our wonderful guest today is Carter, Carter Churchfield, who actually uh, conducts tours mm -hmm. in Chinatown specifically uh, to cover the red light district, right? The seedy side of World War II. Love yes. it, love it. What's not seedy about it? Well, let's talk about it. Uh, well, I've been doing these tours for about three years. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and before uh, this, I was giving tours in Seattle, Washington. So I learned a lot about um, prostitution in the Wild West. And you might be surprised, a lot of the traditions from the Wild West made it to Honolulu uh, for the World War II prostitution ring in Chinatown. Wait, so they traveled from Seattle to come over because there was a like a new business opportunity, so to speak? Well, San Francisco specifically. Oh, now, okay. prostitutes um, have been an export of San Francisco um, for a while. Uh, that's where Seattle got its prostitutes from, Portland, uh, and then plenty of the places during the, the gold rush. Yes. Yeah, some why, of the why San Francisco? Because it, why, why did it start there? Well, uh, the railroads oh, okay. came from the East Coast, and a lot, enough of them uh, ended in San Francisco, and it was an established city. Oh, and then the gold rush, that was what first oh, okay. brought people over. Right. Yeah. So it wasn't just catering to Asian men. <coughs> We're talking about gold rush. I think, you know, the coolie is coming over, but then there are all the people who kind of came in from the Midwest and... Right, and even uh, the Civil War, that wiped out a generation of men folk, so the women had to, um, had to support themselves, sometimes uh -huh. support children, and uh, historically that put a lot of women, uh, sent a lot of women out west, hoping to make enough money, send it back home. Right. Yeah, to feed themselves, feed their families. So before we jump into the World War II business, mm -hmm. right before that, what was Chinatown like? I mean, I, I, there's always been prostitution, and I mm -hmm. don't know why it kind of likes to center around places like Chinatown, mm -hmm. but what was it like, and what's the difference between the pre- and post-war time? Well, it was uh, more of a business district. Oh. Um, the red light district was actually uh, Evie Lay, which is where the Dole Cannery is uh -huh. uh, today, and you know, the movie theater. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so easy to remember. You can think of it as Easy Lay. And <laughs> is that your know. coin's term? Yes. Okay. Um, so, and that was before the, the sailors came, the, before the military came. Uh, so so it was mostly Asian women uh, because their customers were the plantation workers. Um. Yeah, so men from China, um, Japan, Korea, and they want to they want to be able to talk to women in their own language. Um, Often in situations like this, they're not just after uh, physical satisfaction, they're looking for some kind of uh, emotional huh. interaction too. That's yeah. interesting because usually when you think of uh, prostitution, you think wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. You mm -hmm. don't want to have that connection. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about a different type of kind of a companion. Yes, and um, uh, there's, uh, you know, there's a range. There's a range of customers. Uh, there's a range of service providers, um, and a lot uh, seem to go for uh, a, an emotional connection as well. Okay, um, well that's good. That's promising that not all men are bastards. And no, yeah. need a little I'm more. I'm not going there. No. No. Okay, all right. Yeah. But, um, so we say they catered to the Asians, so these Asian ladies were from Hawaii, or they came also from the Oops. mainland? No, they or came from, from Asia. Asia. Yeah. How did they come over? Um, the boats, like, okay, well, like so, you know, do. the madams would get here, set up shop, uh -huh. they want to recruit more women. Um, so I would, I mean, there's a tradition uh, in China, you know, of, it's not as taboo uh, there to be a prostitute. Right. Right. Um, and in Japan, too, you can be a prostitute and then maybe go be a wife. And it, in the West, it 
changes everything. There's before and after, and you can never rejoin society. You are soiled. You are less of. A, you're not a human being anymore. Um, I think that happens worldwide, though. No, it's I mean, a different really? mentality okay. in other countries. All right. Yeah. Okay. So. so then we jump to, I, I hate to jump because there's so much to talk about even before war. Maybe we'll do that oh, another time. Oh, I can time. get to Chinatown, yeah. All right. Um, so basically the cops didn't have very much control in Evile, uh, so they shut it down and kind of reopened it, uh, the red light district in Chinatown. Now the buildings, they're owned by uh, Chinese landlo landlords, um, and they ended up renting to a lot of Irish madams. Now mm -hmm. this is where uh, things shift. The sailors started coming and driving and these white sailors from the mainland, right. they want white women. Okay. They want the girl next door. So um, Irish uh, women were being imported through San Francisco. <laughs> okay, and, good old uh, San Fran. Yes, that's the supply and demand. Right. Now, um, so it was funny, a lot of these uh, women, the madams, they yeah. have clauses in their leases that say um, if, uh, if prostitution gets um, thrown out of the island, uh -huh. they're released from their leases immediately. That way they're not trapped into these expensive leases. The leases between the landlord? And the madams, and yes. Um, and, and they know what kind of business they're going to be doing. Oh, so yeah. It's all and they're making a lot more money uh, renting to a madam than they would a, sure, a different business. Sure, the turnover quick, huh? Oh, absolutely. You want to, uh, I can tell you how quick the turnover oh, is. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, so with the introduction of this ridiculous gender ratio, right. we're talking so strictly single men of marriageable age right. to single women of marriageable age. Yes. Um, one of the kinder statistics I read was 156 single men for every one single woman oh, man. on the island. That is worse than yeah. Alaska. Right. Yeah, and what they say in situations like that, it's, uh, yes, the odds are good, but the goods are odd <laughs> if you're Great a woman. Quote. But so, so how did they initiate the whole business kind of flushing over. Was it uh, government backed or was it just kind of like slowly word of mouth these mama sans, well the Irish mama sans would say hey come on there's good business over here. Uh, I would think word of mouth really Sorry. yes. Um, uh, people letting other people know and uh, there's precedent for this situation in like the wild west towns where men right. greatly outnumber women so uh -huh. some of the traditions, so to speak, made it out here. Um, for instance, a time limit. Um, and this time limit was usually three minutes per man. Wow. Yeah. And in some of the <laughs> World War II towns, uh, it was even two minutes, 30 seconds. Just, but between the men, was there like a time where they could change the sheets or, I don't know. Well, if since it's a numbers game, yeah. um, and now a lot of the women in, in Hawaii working in this way, yeah. they knew that there window for making a ton of money yes. was the war. So because okay. they knew it was going to close, they were trying to get the numbers. Right. This um, leads to a system called the bullpen being imported. The bullpen, again brought from the Wild West, is uh, where each woman had four or maybe five different rooms. Okay. So she'd have a waiting man <gasps> in each. She could just go from oh, room to room geez. to room. Yeah, pretty sensational stuff. And these are just your, uh, what did you say, lower class girls from There's California? a range. Now, um, so for, they're coming from all over the United States. Okay. Uh, oh, going started from, yeah. right, okay. And then they end up in San Francisco, um, and then they can audition to you come You have to, to audition? Hawaii. Well, you got to prove you can uh, do. Perform? Yeah, perform within that window. Okay. Right? Um, now, the most famous uh, woman to come out here was Jean O'Hara. Okay. She's from Chicago. All right. And she uh, is unusual. For instance, uh, she was the daughter of a dentist. Uh huh. Yeah, so she. Oh no, how did her parents she feel about was, this? Well, she got into the profession, she said, because she wanted the jewelry and the clothing <sighs> that uh, the ladies could afford. She saw the women down the street right. and saw their independence. Now, this is a woman who uh, is incredibly feisty and. Um, by the time, so she got into this profession, and then once she decided maybe she wanted to get out, uh, she was too ashamed to go back home. So remember what I said earlier about um, in the West, in the United States, once you once your virtue is lost, right, that changes you. You're not quite right. you're labeled a human you can't being. Go back, yeah. Right. 
So. But why did she become so famous? What What did she do? Was she like oh. the top performer, or what? The men were kind of wanted her. Well, she wrote an expose. Uh huh. So um, most women, when they get into the trade, they use fake names because uh, their dream is to get out of the trade um, and be able to take their money and move to a new place, right. but pass themselves off as a widow uh -huh. and be respectable. But she did not care. Okay. She wrote this expose, um, and uh, which talks about how this, by the way, illegal prostitution ring, because prostitution is illegal in the territory of Hawaii, is still being run by the cops. Wait, so if it's not legal, mm -hmm. who's this? Was this just a random photo this of a This is a random photo. That, yeah, that looks like a lady um, enjoying herself. I don't think she was a prostitute because uh -huh. she's out somewhere where she can be photographed. Right. And the lives of the prostitutes were highly regulated by the vice squad. If, uh, if, um, by the way, they usually prefer the term sporting girls uh, throughout the Wild West. If a sporting girl um, is out and about, she's not allowed in the nice cafes, she's not allowed in nice restaurants, she's not allowed in golf courses. Who set these Waikiki. rules? Wait, who set these rules? You said it's the squad. Is this the police who are running this business? Who are keeping it orderly. So the yes. government was aware of... Oh, very. And, and profiting greatly. Um, yeah, so how did the money go? So how much was taken out of the mamasans and then given off to the girls? Oh, that's a great question. All right, so breaking it down, each trick was about $3. For $3 for three minutes. Yeah, okay. so um, out of each $3, uh, the girls got to keep $2. Well, the madam took a dollar right off the top. That's right. how the madam makes a shocking amount of money. Uh, you Are you that's ready like, for how much money please. the madams were making? Okay. Okay. Throw it. Upwards of 150000 dollars a year. In those days? Yes, in the 30s and 40s. What is that worth today? Jeez, yeah, about two million upwards. And Are there yeah. any stories of these mamasans and have they told or released any, there's no documentations of these ladies? I haven't found, uh, I haven't found any information. Mostly uh, people focus on Jean O'Hara because right. okay. she She's was, the... in a word, shameless. Right. She didn't care. Uh, she was uh, going to make a lot of money yeah. and uh, not let anybody keep her down. So you, you know, you said that they brought in the, you know, all-American girl to cater to the fancies of the all-American boy. Mm -hmm. But in the Army, Navy, everywhere, it's not just all white boys. I mean, there were Asians and blacks. Thank so, you for asking about okay. that. Yes, so um, what was imported with the white servicemen was also a deep-seated racism. Uh-huh, of course. Yes, so they want to, they don't want to think that they're having sex with the same women who are having sex with non-whites. <sighs> so what the brothels end up doing, some of them, is they put two different doors. Okay. And white servicemen oh, can no. go through one door for three dollars, longer lines, and right. um, locals uh, and non-whites can go through the other door, and they're only charged two dollars. But it's the same women. Um, yeah. Wait, wait. So the the servicemen didn't know it was the same women, but yeah, it's just a different door. Yeah. You have a picture of all these sailors lining up in Chinatown. Oh yes, I think we have that in there. That was um, it's in there. Now this is oh, Chinatown, yeah. right? Uh, it's somewhere in the area. I have not been able, I mean, it could be the building doesn't exist anymore. Um, Please but don't tell me this is the line for their three-minute excursion. Um, it possibly, but here's, <laughs> a better, here's an even better photograph with even yeah. more men. And this one I uh, have placed. This is um, on Merchant Street. Oh, okay. The building doesn't exist oh, anymore, no. but that's the Black Cat Cafe. And if you watch the movie Pearl Harbor with Ben Affleck, there's a scene where he's in a oh. diner, which is the Black okay. Cat Cafe. Well, wow, wow, wow. So, so much stuff. Um, Carter, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to get thrown right back into it like we were lining up for it. And you mm -hmm. can get, bring us into those rooms and tell us more juicy details of sure how thing. it was then. The All protocol. Right. Don't go away. Aloha, this is Reg Baker with Business in Hawaii. We're a show that broadcasts every Thursday at 2 o'clock. We would love to hear from you, and you can reach us in several different ways. We have a hotline that you can call in at 415-871-2474, or you can email us at thinktechhawaii.com, or you can tweet us at thinktechhi. Looking forward to hearing from you and seeing you on our next show. Aloha. 
Aloha, I'm Kaui Lucas, host of Hawaii is my mainland here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday afternoon at 3 p.m. Start your Pauhana weekend off with the show where I talk to people about issues pertinent to Hawaii. You can see my previous shows at my blog, kauilucas.com, and also on Think Tech's show. Sorry. Welcome back to Quack Talk, talking about World War II prostitution in Chinatown and the su supply and demand and catering to all those hungry, horny sailors out there. So we're back with Carter Churchfield, mm -hmm. and we just left off showing a photo of this really crazy times when they were lining up right in Chinatown mm -hmm. for a little release. Yes, uh, there was a pretty strict protocol. Um, when a sailor would get in line, sometimes he would have to wait uh, over two hours. And uh, <laughs> when he goes through the door, well, first of all, the, the brothel's got its own bouncer. Oh, Wait, how called, many businesses were there? There were about 15, um, around 15. Okay. They're called boogie houses all right. at this so point in choose, time. Right? Okay. Yeah, so it's the bouncer's job to do the first screening, and if the guy seems tame, like uh, not too drunk, or oh. not likely to be violent. Well, that's the thing. Were they mostly drunk before their performance? Yeah. Then three minutes, is that going to do it? <laughs> uh, well, that's why the girls had to audition, you know. Um, so then, uh, then you go up the stairs. These are all, always on the second floor of buildings. Uh, to be able to maintain order. Did you say that these buildings still exist in Chinatown? Oh yeah, many of them. That's what I take. That's what I do on my tour. Yeah, we'll talk about um, to that later. You can yeah. tell them. Yeah. So um, so you go upstairs and then you interact with the cashier if you're a sailor. And okay. the cashier is usually the madam. Okay. You pay your three dollars and one dollar bills, and the madam um, might give you either like a chip, like a wooden chip. Or a kind of uh, like a token or a kind ticket. of a thing. Yes, right. And um, then you go into a little cubicle when it's free, uh, and you get undressed to your comfort level. You wait till a woman walks in. Then you hand her the chip <laughs> or the ticket. She saves them up. At the end of her shift, she uh, gets paid accordingly. Right. So she turns in, in her tokens for how much yeah. money she made that day. Yeah. So sometimes in the Wild West, they would use corks from champagne bottles. Okay. So. Um, now, still more protocol. Oh. Uh, the woman gets to inspect the man's genitals for signs of disease. This is oh. the most important part for well, her. Well, that's good. They educated them to at least go yeah. for that. Wait, were condoms created then? Uh, they were, but are you ready for this? Okay. What are they made out of? <laughs> various things. Sometimes, and this is going to gross you out, sheep's guts. <laughs> Uh, no, but that's silk. more natural, um, isn't it? I don't know. I try not to think about <laughs> okay, it, quite all right. honestly. All right. um, so where was I? Oh, right. Condoms were illegal until 1930 in the United States. 1930s? Yeah, this is from uh, like about 18, I think 1887. Anything that prevented conception oh, okay. was illegal because right. it promotes immoral activity. Oh, yes. Oh, shame, shame. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So wait, mm -hmm. who provided the condoms then? Oh, they didn't have condoms. So they didn't? Yeah. Wait, the 40s though, no? Or uh, well, all right. If, I'm sure time? if you wanted to bring your own, you could use it. But I'm talking about in the okay. boogie house. You have time to have it on. You got three minutes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. so, get right um, to work. So the girls get to inspect the man's genitals for signs of disease. Okay. If he passes the inspection, she gets to wash them off with a clean washcloth. <laughs> he washes them. Oh, nice. And um, and then that's when the three minutes starts. Okay. Yes. Now she had like a little buzzer. <laughs> well, egg timers <laughs> were often used in in brothels from since they were invented. Um, so is it the mama son in charge of the timer or no? Should no, it would be the girl. Their, the mama okay. son's out there um, take, you know, taking money. The right. money's the most important part, so she right. should really be sure. focused on that. That's okay. why they're all here is the money. Right. So after the three minutes, um, the sailor was then expected to visit a prophylactic station somewhere in the area. Yes. Let me just say... We've come a long way in our understanding of how pregnancy happens, how diseases <laughs> spread. Right. They just didn't know. They thought that you could go to a prophylactic station afterwards, run by the military, by the way, and you could get a colloidal silver solution, rub it on yeah. your genitals, and that would prevent disease. You know what it does? What? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not even, uh, all right. No. So, and that's like 
posts, you know, activities. Yes. So mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense. And you know, a lot of so a lot of the women here, they well, they all had to be screened every week for disease. Right. And if they tested positive, they were pulled off the floor. Now remember how I broke down the three dollars dollar off the top yes. goes straight to the madam. Out of the remaining two dollars, the woman has to pay for her own gynecological exams weekly, her own um, s tests. Uh, as well as tip the maid, tip the bouncer, uh, pay for room and board. Oh. So, yeah, that, that $2 gets skimmed down. Oh, right. and, you know, pay off the vice squad. Oh, yeah. so there's a lot of kind of the... Uh, yeah, a lot under, of graft. Yeah. Um, Was there violence and a lot of abuse towards these women? In this particular system, uh, not as much as other systems. Um, the girls, I mean, this is going to sound funny, but it was said that um, because of the way their lives were regulated, um, they were living in the boogie houses, you weren't allowed to have alcohol, uh, you weren't allowed to have men in the back rooms. Uh -huh. It was a lot like a nunnery. Wow. Except That's like profession. kind of a contradictory yeah. comparison. But uh -huh. And so they had regulations, they couldn't go out at a certain time of the day. The, yes, the boogie house curfew was 10.30 at night, and uh -huh. uh, of course they weren't allowed to go to Waikiki. Why? What was Waikiki like during that time? It was for uh, Is that a club in Chinatown? Or is that in yes, this is where Bar 35 is today. I don't know Bar 35, it's, but okay. It's, uh, they got good pizza. Um, <laughs> so, the, and, and they had jazz greats come out here. Uh, they had Duke Ellington. Oh. They had Sarah Vaughn come out here, and there's a plaque ah. with her name on it. And wouldn't you know, they misspelled her name in the sign. Oh. Yeah, they left oh. out her G spot. Wait, so this was kind of a bar slash kind of hangout slash prostitution? Oh, uh, no, oh. this photograph was taken um, after oh, the okay, war. Okay, so where they kind of like. And uh, prostitution ended very dramatically here. So, Remember uh, Gina O'Hara, mm. right? She write, writes this expose, right? Um, and this is kind of in revenge because um, she did get beaten up by a police oh. officer very savagely. <gasps> Um, so she writes this expose, right? And it details all the illegal activity going on here. Huh. Now, a copy of this actually makes it into the hands of some congressmen in Washington D.C. And uh, they, I'm sure they had no clue before that that uh, this was all going on, or that it was so public. Right. Okay. Um, so they contact uh, people in power here, yeah. and they say, "Hey, if." If this is actually what's going on, uh, you can kiss your dreams of statehood goodbye. So, so they quickly cleaned yes, up. They, in one day, um, the po chief of police managed to deport over half the prostitutes from Chinatown back to San Francisco. How many are we talking about? Roughly? About uh, between 200, 250. Okay, all in the small space of Smith. Hotel. Oh yeah, just that. Oh whole. yeah. Oh yes, yes. So the boundaries. Yeah. Okay. The yeah. boundaries for this district. The girls had to live and work and live their lives inside uh, the barrier between Merchant Street uh -huh. and Baratania and New Uanu and River Street. Okay. So very small. How did the Chinese feel about them? Kind of taken over that whole area? Uh, well, the ones who were making money um, off of renting to the madams uh, were super happy. Oh, sure. They were making tons of money. Right. Uh, then, of course, there were a lot of people who could sell food um, at, or what anything else, sell right. anything else that was diverting or fun to the sailors, uh, made a lot of money, uh, even shoeshine boys. But right. Then there's, you know, the regular people who aren't making money, who just want to go about their daily lives. Yeah. So uh, the, the pictures you've seen, you've seen sailors in their white uniforms. Right. And imagine women wearing their native dress, Cheong Sam's, kimonos, or right. mumus. Right. And right. they got to push through these lines of sailors yeah. just to go to the bakers. Because you have a picture. I don't think we have this on the line, but mm -hmm. if you can hold it up. This is a small picture of like the girls at this one hotel. Oh. <laughs> Hotel. Oh, <laughs> wink, yeah. wink. Uh, boogie house. So, um, and they're quite. I mean, it's a fuzzy picture, but they're mm. quite glamorous. Oh, yeah. Yes. They have well, some pretty dresses, and this is a promotional photograph, oh, you know, course. designed to entice the men uh -huh. to pay them a visit oh. over uh, the other boogie houses. Oh, right. And this is so. If you go to Chinatown, yeah. there's Mauna Kea Market, that's where the yeah. clock tower is. Right. There's the bigger entrance that opens onto Hotel Street, and directly across is the building that was the new Senator Hotel. This is the most famous boogie house uh, in Chinatown because it was immortalized in the movie From Here to Eternity. 
So From Here to Eternity, famous book, famous movie. Um, in, in the movie, it's called The New Senator Hotel. Um, and the women who worked there are, um, are portrayed by Donna Reed now and uh, other actresses. Wow. So how, how reflective do you think that uh, film was? of the times. Was it a pretty genuine depiction, you would say? Yes, Great. yes. The author, oh. James Jones, he would frequent the New Senator Hotel himself, huh. and so he actually got to know the ladies and base the characters on the ladies. Um, and and the block that the New Senator is in also has Wo Fat Restaurant, which a lot of locals will was remember. Like a... Yeah, and that restaurant was open for a hundred years, oh. up until 1982. And it's, there's also scenes um, in the uh, From Here to Eternity that are, take place in that restaurant, so yeah. it's a very historical block. Okay, very cool. Um, I remember you mentioning before the interview that the men had to come, they had a curfew bef to, yes. to visit Chinatown. Tell us mm -hmm. about that. So um, through some trial and error, the military realized that um, if you let the men stay out past 2 p.m., so many of them would get so drunk and disorderly that it would require a tremendous effort to restore order. So their curfew is 2 p.m. Um, so they go there in the morning? Yes, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. And that means that the prostitutes had to meet <gasps> to their wake quota up by 2 p.m. <gasps> wow, morning. Well, that's okay because morning bonus will work for the sailors. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Roll out of bed, get on that shuttle. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in our short time left, I mean, it's fascinating information and it's such an interesting look at history mm -hmm. through the uh, prostitution. Um, Carter, can you just give us a little taste or, well, you have given us a taste, but mm -hmm. your tour, you've created this tour of the Red Light District in Chinatown. What's that about? Mm -hmm. Let us know how to do it. Well, um, I started learning about um, the, this, the more salacious history in Chinatown, and I realized no one's really talking about it. Yeah. So I created this uh, historical walking tour. Um, you can go and see the, some of the boogie houses uh, where the girls worked out of, and also learn more about the motto, let's go get stewed, screwed, <laughs> and tattooed. Oh. Yeah, so I can show you the oldest bar in Hawaii, Smith's Union Bar, and this is where boys from the Arizona would go and drink and get stewed. Then they could go around the corner, maybe get uh, tattooed at Sailor Jerry's uh, Tattoo Parlor. Uh, now it's called Old Ironsides Tattoo. And then, of course, I talk about the lives of the women um, and also how the police were involved. Oh, yeah, yeah I like that. I like that. You're mm -hmm. taking all this nitty gritty stuff out into the table. Mm -hmm. um, wonderful stuff. So people can just go online to uh, search for your Yes, the tour. website is honoluluexposed.com. Uh, I give these tours most days at 9.30 a.m. Right, mm -hmm. right and early. Mm -hmm. Get that thing going. Well, Carter, it's been fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Thank you so much for having me. And, you know, open your eyes to a different angle on history and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for tuning in.